So, where does our faith come from? I mean, God, of course. But how is it shaped? How is it nurtured? Because usually there's someone else's story that influences ours. It could be a faith story that we read in the Bible. It could be the faith journey of someone who matters in our lives or someone we just met briefly. But I'm guessing that most of us could probably say that our own faith was in part shaped by the faith of our ancestors. Our parents, our grandparents, etc. Now, we may have followed in their path or their traditions, or we may have reacted against it. But either way, their faith story shapes ours. Since it's Father's Day, I'd like to share with you a little bit about my own father's faith story. Now, my father was a lifelong Roman Catholic. He grew up in an immigrant community in Baltimore, Maryland. So his faith and his sense of neighborhood and belonging, they were basically all intermingled. He attended mass and parochial school. He served as an altar boy and a chorister, and he was a product of Jesuit high school and Jesuit college. When he relo relocated his own young family to California in 1970, it was a given that he would seek out and attend the local parish. <clears throat> now, my father wasn't an activist. In fact, he definitely had been raised to just, you know, not make a lot of waves. For him, serving God meant serving in his local church. He found God by gathering in community in a place where his family and he were known. He found God by singing and praying the holy liturgies that he prayed his entire life. They barely changed, except for the language. He found God by receiving communion pretty much every Sunday without fail. I'm not sure that I can recall my father telling me about a faith encounter in the way that we think of it today. Though he did tell me once that he was asked to consider the priesthood like most academically gifted boys would have been in parochial high schools in his day. Because he had learned all of that theology as well as Latin and Greek, he loved to talk with me about God. He loved to sit there and tease apart the Trinity or salvation or how free will really works. And you know what? Those conversations that my dad and I used to have, they gave me a really great sense of how he experienced God as the one who permeated his whole being and all that is. Now, in those conversations, he pretty much stayed away from the hot button social issues like, you know, birth control. That was a big one in the 70s. But there was only my brother and I. So I kind of had a feeling I knew where he stood on that issue on a practical level. <laughs> he also let me express all of my own critiques of the church's stance on all kinds of things. I mean, it's clear that all of that Catholic liberal arts education meant that he valued free inquiry. My dad could readily admit to the church's human flaws, 
but it was at heart the locus on earth of the body of Christ. So for him, dissent was kind of something that you kept to the private sphere in his eyes. I, I, I kind of think that he really only started talking about his personal encounters with God when he joined a Bible study after his retirement. So I think he spent most of his life supporting the work of his local, local church as a participant and a leader. That's how he experienced God. It's how he lived his faith. And it brought him great delight to celebrate the traditions that he'd grown up with and also to watch how they changed. I mean, he loved, was proud of how his own church in Sunnyvale had been transformed by the waves of immigrants that had come from Asia and the Philippines over the time that he had been there and all of the wonderful, rich, new music and traditions that came with them. So, how does my father's faith story shape mine? Well, I have been gifted the love and the ability to experience God through being in community, just like he did. I mean, I admire all of those individual spiritual disciplines, but they don't feed me quite the same way that getting together to pray and to worship does. But I also have to say that for me, how that community embodies its faith is really key to me. So I went out and I chose a church where doubt, dissent, and change could be public and open and in dialogue with all those changes in the wider world. I love to ponder God and how God is at work. I loved those conversations with my dad because they helped me to see how God is at work in us and through us. And that's, I love having those conversations philosophically, but also about the pragmatics of it all. My dad and I, we agree that it is exciting to see how God is transforming humanity. And I, too, am more of a get your hands dirty with the work of the church type servant of Christ than the lead a movement type. I meet God through music and liturgy. I mean, you guys have all heard me talk about that stuff, right? I get a little excited about it. And I love the sublime traditional things that we've been handed down. And I love the new creations and the things that come from the gifts of all of our world's cultures. <clears throat> and I have to say, I definitely learned from him how to make sense of my encounters with God through scripture, art, and poetry. Understanding the faith journeys of our ancestors brings us closer and deeper into our own faith, I think. See, stories of where and how we meet God, there's something to be shared. They're treasures, and they get to be handed down from generation to generation. So I have to say it's not surprising that that genre generation after generation passing down their stories of their encounters with God. That genre is all throughout scripture, all throughout the Bible. <clears throat> this summer, this is the, for, for people who are, are lectionary nerds, this is year A. <laughs> we are in ordinary time and that means we will follow one of those long arcs of faith stories that's in our Bible. It's called ordinary time because we get to do that in order. We're not bouncing around, you know, hitting the high points and low points. We're going to follow the family of Abraham and Sarah and their progeny for probably 12 plus 
weeks. So get ready for a really good ride. <laughs> that's the narrative that's at the heart of our biblical faith. And we will get to hear the stories of these ancestors of our faith as they meet God face to face in the midst of their otherwise ordinary lives. Now, so, like I said, some traditions call this season ordinary time because we follow them in order. But I like also that these are all of the stories of the ordinary people that meet God in some of the most unexpected, and I have to admit, sometimes pretty crazy ways and places. Some of them find it laughable how God shows up in their lives and what God does in and through them. In fact, laughter is our theme for today, it seems. We heard it. Sarah laughed when she got that news from God. I have found us a traveling companion too, kind of a guide along our journey for the summer in the form of a series of paintings in a study journal called Anything But Ordinary. And the, the painting was in the pip for this week. It's on the cover of your bulletin. It's on the door. And if you want to, you can grab the study journals that are out in the basket on our parish life table on your way out and take them home with you and have them for you for the summer. And we'll have to make sure we get them emailed out for the people who are part of our um, shall we call it St. Philip's East congregation? <laughs> I hope that you guys will consider this an opportunity to like listen to these faith stories and then to share your own faith stories as we go forward into things like coffee hour and all of the other ways that we gather during the week. So as I was looking at this week's picture when I was doing my reflections yesterday, I have to say that immediately the first thing I notice is that Sarah is watching the action from afar. Mm -hmm. Yep. She, I don't know, she looks kind of tense and uncertain of what to make of the situation. As she stares out of that tent, you can see her standing in the tent flap, and out there is Abraham talking with their three visitors. I think it's a potent image an image of this kind of precipice between hope and resignation that she kind of hangs right on the edge of all throughout this reading. It's like she knows that they're talking about her, but she's not sure what to do with it. And can you blame her? I mean, people have probably always talked about her just out of earshot. Talked about Sarah, called the Baron in our readings. You could just hear them, poor Sarah, so beautiful, but she never got to have children. Now I wanna be clear, I am reflecting attitudes of the time that come through in our text. I am not condoning them. And I don't think that those people meant to be unkind, but still it must have hurt to hear those words. Maybe she and her husband even left to get away from some of that. But I have to say it probably doesn't hurt near as much as being asked to tear open that old wound of hope again. I mean, I would like to believe that at 90 years of age, she had made peace with all of that stuff years ago. So would you open yourself up to all of that emotional turmoil again? Because I have to say I'm not sure that I would. The other thing that really stood out to me is that road that bisects the painting. It goes from one corner right down the center to the other. And it's, I think, both a division, but also a kind of invitation. It's a division that protects Sarah from all of those promises that are being made by that mysterious set of divine visitors. 
At the same time that it's a kind of invitation into a radically different future that those promises could actually hold for her. Now, I doubt you can see this in the print that's on the bulletin, but check out the picture by the door on your way out or look at your emails because there is gold paint sort of sprinkled across the picture. It shimmers kind of with light and promise. And it's spread most liberally across the ground that's behind the three visitors. But the other thing about it is it looks like it's just started to blow across <laughs> to where Sarah is. It's <clears throat> kind of gotten on her dress. Like she sort of picked it up as she's bustling around without even trying. Liesel Gwyn Garrity, who's the artist, says that she painted gold wherever God might be active. It's a kind of little code. And you know, we're gonna get a couple more of her paintings throughout the summer, so I think that coding carries through, so you can kind of watch for that as we're moving forward. Now, this painting, it doesn't as readily invite us into Abraham's perspective, but you know what? The text definitely does that for us. We don't actually know if he recognized those visitors as divine or not, but boy, does he ever roll out that welcome wagon. <laughs> There's all kinds of fetching and hurrying. I think those two words get used like nine or 10 times. It's like he's really scrambling for them. And it's, it's what biblical commentators like to call extravagant hospitality. It's full of hyperbole. I mean, those cakes of bread that he has Sarah whip up from three measures of choice flour, I'm told that's enough to make 12 loaves of bread. 12 loaves of bread. We were speculating at um, 8 o'clock how long it would have actually taken to prepare this. Oh, we reckon 24 to 48 hours. <laughs> Abraham, I mean, he says, oh, here, can I get you a little morsel and a tad of water and let you rest your feet? But really, he's laying out a feast fit for a king. I mean, all that gold, it could just as easily have been representing Abraham's abundant hospitality that's just sort of filling out into that dry desert that his visitors have just come through. So why the difference between Abraham and Sarah's willingness to engage with God when God shows up on their doorstep. I thought about that and I was wondering if maybe it's partially because Abraham, well, he actually has already been given a son at this point in the narrative through Hagar. And we'll, we'll meet her next week. Oh boy. There's a lot in that story. <laughs> But I also want to just step back because, let's face it, when Abraham was first told that he was going to have a son in his also ripe old age, I think he's about 10 years older than Sarah, he laughed at God too. So Abraham's had a little bit more time to get there. And Sarah, we know she gets there too. And she, she has Isaac. Kind of my takeaway from this is that once we start to recognize the ways that God is at work in our lives, only then does it become easier and easier to trust when those encounters kind of land on our doorstep. Another way of putting this is that as we experience God and faith, our faith grows through all of that. And I think that's part of the promise of our summer's journey with these anything but ordinary stories of faith. <clears throat> I loved how the writer of our journal summarizes it. These stories are potent with drama and disappointment, punctuated by a God who keeps showing up persistently, creatively, and lovingly in the mess of the mundane, of family life, God works in ways that are surprising, transformative, joyful, reconciling, and unifying. 
the movement of the spirit is anything but ordinary. So I wonder if any of you have faith stories from your fathers or mothers or grandparents about times when God provided the very thing that they had hoped for desperately and resigned themselves to never having. I wonder if any of you have stories of times when your ancestors offered abundant hospitality to a stranger and then received a surprise gift that came their way because of it. So I hope, I hope that we all will spend this summer remembering, reflecting on and sharing these kinds of faith stories, like the treasures that they are. I hope they will nurture us in the spirit so that we can get better at better at sharing our own stories of how we too have met God in our own ordinary lives in ways that give us laughter, love, and faith. Amen.